Hi, I'm Ron Bullis, the president and founder of LifeWorks Advisors. I am really excited to get to have this conversation today with someone who I consider to be a visionary and a leader in the wealth management space. And I'm looking forward to asking him some interesting questions about his insights and his vision for the future of wealth management, custody, digital assets, and how technology is gonna change how advisors and clients interact with their money and their lives. Before I jump in, I'm gonna read a quick bio so that we have a setup for who our guest is today. In his role as the Chief Executive Officer at Apex Clearing, he sets the vision and strategy to help Apex identify and realize new areas of growth and opportunity. Under his guidance, Apex continues to be a proven leader in custody and clearing, helping to power the digital revolution in financial services. Prior to his role as the CEO of Apex, he previously worked at Convergix Group, where he was the chief of staff and a member of the firm's executive committee. As chief of staff, he managed the critical internal and external initiatives for the company and was responsible for the firm's options, prime services, global clearing, and commission sharing arrangement business. He also served as a director at Pershing LLC and was responsible for their institutional product suite and directed their global re-engineering efforts firm-wide. He is a current board member of Trader Tools, a privately held trading technology solutions company, as well as an advisory board member of Robust Wealth, a digital wealth management platform technology provider. He previously sat on the board of Convergex and currently serves as the chairman of the board for Apex Clearing Corporation. In addition to all that, he is a partner at Peak Six Investments LLC, the parent company of Apex Clearing. I'm really excited to welcome our guest, William Capuzzi, the CEO and leader of Apex Clearing. Bill, welcome to The Future of Advice. Ron, great to see you. Thanks for having me on. Um, well, I've got a ton of questions. I'm sure we're not going to get to all of them today. Thanks for carving time out of your busy schedule to, to do this. Um, before we get started, uh, for the advisors and clients that are watching this, um, one of the unique things about Apex is most people don't know who Apex Clearing and um, Corp, uh, clearing uh, and custody is probably by design. Start by maybe just giving us a, a thirty thousand foot picture of who Apex is, what your role in the industry's been, um, where you guys are, you know, currently positioning yourselves. Yeah, sure. So I think that you know, look, the first thing, and you said it, we are truly a custodian, and there's not many true custodians. There's folks that sit. Uh, somewhere in the stack providing solutions, but we actually custody and hold the asset and we take that really seriously. Right? Our job is to hold, protect, process transactions on behalf of our customers um, for their end investors. Um, I think the way that we differentiate ourselves, you mentioned in the intro, my time at Pershing, I spent roughly a decade um, at Pershing. Um, and I think the way we differentiate ourselves from now, the big, I guess, the big three, right? So Pershing, Schwab, slash TD, and, and Fidelity mm -hmm. is technology, right? Is how do you think about all of the functions that happen within, you know, sort of a traditional custodial arrangement or relationship between an advisor and a custodian, but think about them through a totally technology lens, right? So the concept of a NIGO, which is a term that's thrown around in our industry left and right, it just doesn't exist at Apex, right? Um, and the reason for it is we've used technology to sort of drive uh, as much efficiency as we possibly can. Uh, and so the way I think about Apex is, uh, for those of your audience that know Shopify, we're sort of the Shopify of investing, right? The platform, it basically is an API first shop that um, that advisors would sit on top of and effectively take all of those transactions would have which has lots and lots and lots of inefficiencies in them today and strip that away and create a real time straight through uh, sort of pleasant experience for the advisor and the end customer. Now, I, I might get this wrong, but I think to my knowledge, you guys, Apex, is one of the only custodians that doesn't have a very like large and, and intentional push in the direct to retail space, correct? You guys don't have you know retail offices around the country. You're not competing with advisors for their business, correct? Yeah, I, and you know I think whether it's directly or indirectly, we're now the last remaining truly independent, right? So we're we're not part of any big conglomerate. Um, and we're also really the only you know, person, you know, the only custodian that's out there that doesn't have a B to C component, right? So 
Mm-hmm. You know, Pershing has the Bank of New York who has advisors who are pitching uh, end customers, obviously Schwab, TD, and Fidelity. Pershing is solely B2B. Um, that's sort of our mission in life is to service the advisors and, and the broker dealers we have as, as partners. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back a bit um, and ask a question about you. You have what I think is one of the coolest, um, I'm not going to say mission statements, um, but purpose statements on your LinkedIn profile. Um, and you know, all of us have been on LinkedIn and, and we read little blurbs about people's companies. Unfortunately, I think in the wealth management space, our stuff goes through compliance five, six, seven times and kind of comes out pretty boring. I want to read a clip of it. And then before we kind of jump into talking more about technology and the future advice, I want to, um, I want to just ask you a couple of questions about it and then go from there. So on your LinkedIn profile, you said, I come to work to change the world sounds pretentious. I know, but I mean it from the heart. I'm privileged to be in the right place, financial services, at the right time, the dawn of digitization, and working with the right people, brilliant and devoted, to make a difference for millions of investors. All of which is possible because I'm stationed at the right lever of investing's massive machinery, operations. So, Share with us, expound on this a little bit. I've got a couple more things from your LinkedIn profile, especially the book that you mentioned, which also happens to be one of my favorite. Uh, but expound on this a little bit because operations in whatever industry somebody might be in that's watching this, and, and for those of us in the wealth management space, we think of compliance, we think of the boring stuff, we think of the pain in the butt stuff that we really don't wanna do, but we have to do. Talk about why you believe that you are in the right place and, and what that means, um, why you wrote this mission statement. Well, so I'll tell you, I had a conversation with a friend in the industry who was a founder of one of the, one of the largest advisor firms that's out there today. And um, he likened custody to uh, a, a gasoline provider. He said, I don't really care. I just pull in. It doesn't really matter whether it's Exxon or mobile. Yeah. You just kind of pull in and get your gas. Uh, and uh, I, I thought that was... Um, it was sad, frankly, that, that this industry has sort of created this perception of the custodial function as sort of totally commoditized. The reality is it's not, right? And I think to the point about, you know, we're a mission-driven company. I'm a mission-driven person, right? Just I have a zest for life and, right, I want to do things that are really impactful. And I think from a custody standpoint, I think the best line to sort of really kind of reinforce this is you can't fake real time. It either isn't or it is. Yeah. Right? And when yeah. you think about your own life, right, just think about, you know, we were talking before we started recording about our kids. Um, you know, there's a, there's an Amazon box that shows up at my house every day, at least one. Okay. And <laughs> that experience is, it's real time. It's, it's pleasant. Yeah. It's, it's a, you know, it's sort of immediate, um, you know, find something it's you, you, you trust that it's a good product and it shows up same day or the next day. Great. I mean, who would have thought we could do this 10 years ago um, from a custody standpoint, sort of the same thing, which is why does it take, forget about, two, three, five days to open an account. Why does it take more than five seconds to open an account, right? Mm -hmm. If Ron, as the end customer or an advisor, gives you his credentials, right? His address, social security number, his driver's license, you should be able to open that account with Ron sitting there, me as the advisor, in seconds. Doesn't make Mm -hmm. any sense to me, right? And the same in terms of real-time transactions, the reason why this industry is still T2, right? So we settle transactions, trades today, settles two days from now, okay? Mm-hmm. The reason for it isn't because DTCC is inefficient or doesn't have their act together. It's because the custodial world lives in a batch environment. And come mm-hmm. back to the Amazon analogy is it matters. It really matters because in all other aspects of our life, Things happened fast, real time. There's, there's, there's delightful experiences, but we have sort of lowered the bar and conditioned advisors and customers, broker dealers to think that this is about as good as it can get. So go back to that, you know, gasoline. Yeah, it's because 
all the big players all do it exactly the same. Yeah, there's a little bit of a tweak here, and maybe the pricing over there is a little bit better or worse. But by and large, the offering is the same. So whether it's Exxon or mobile or get-go, um, you know, in terms of gas providers, they look the same. You know, Apex has taken a totally different you know, stance and a different direction in terms of what we're doing. Yeah, it's so it's, it's interesting. I was having a conversation with some people in the technology space and, and talking specifically about fintech and uh, decentralized finance and some things I'll ask you about. And one of them kind of tossed out the comment that advisors and clients have just kind of relegated themselves to the fact that this industry has to feel like you're going to the DMV, right? Um, when, when you mentioned NIGO, right, for, for clients that are maybe watching this, uh, a NIGO means not in good order. Um, when we're transferring assets from one firm to another or we're moving an investment account, right? The, the thing no advisor or portfolio manager wants to see is something coming back from the custodian saying, not in good order, got to go get more signatures, got to go get more paper. Um, and I think this idea of, you know, just accepting that as, as the standard. I'll, I'll give you a, um, another interesting one. I asked a group of advisors uh, last year, um, and, and this was a, a study group of some pretty, you know, sophisticated you know, firms and advisors that have been around a while. And I said, how many of you have actually used any of the robo uh, advisor platforms or, you know, tried out like a Robin Hood or an Acorn or a, a Stash? And out of like 18 of us in the room, none of them have tried it. And I said, so for those of us that are running firms and are thinking about serving our clients, like our clients can open investment accounts instantly, link a bank account, and be off to the races and trading and making investments and doing all the things that roll back you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you had to have a license for it. You had to go, you know, through this massive process to get approved for it, you, you know, and, and now it's instantaneous, right? Um, and, and I see this from the custodians too. They'll say to us, uh, yeah, we have digital account opening, right? You know, you fill out a form, you hit send, it goes to DocuSign, then it goes to your client's email. They hopefully pass the validation. I always fail because I'm Ron Bullis the third, so I get you know, all kinds of issues there. Um, and, and when you talk about digital experience and a delightful experience, right, um, the clients and the advisors that you guys work for, their platforms are client pushes a button 24 seven and they're ready to go, right? I think um, it makes sense just to give some context or historical context for, for your audience around Apex clients. So you mentioned Robinhood, um, Stash, SoFi, Betterment, uh, Wealthfront uh, years ago, you know, anybody who's trying to disrupt M1, Altruist, anybody mm -hmm. who's trying to disrupt um, either the brokerage world or the advisor world, um, by and large partners with Apex. And partly because you can't, like I said before, you can't fake real time, right? They're, they're out there on the front lines with an app, right? They're, yeah. There's no human. And so you can't, it either works or it doesn't, right? There's no yeah. faking it. And so what they need from a partner is account opening and funding and trading and settling and ACATs and transfers and money movements. All of those things have to happen in a real time way. Because if they don't, um, you know, effectively that same person who's staring at their phone and using, you know, Shopify is a good example or, you know, a Snapchat for my kids. There's, there's that sort of immediacy to that. And the fact that they come over here and it takes two or three days to open an account, people will never come back to funding, right? The Delta between opening and funding, if there's more than seconds, people won't continue the process. Hmm. You lost an account. And I think the proof point, which back to the point about being mission driven, which is really near and dear to me is we're opening somewhere to the tune of 600,000 accounts a month. We've opened roughly 6 million accounts year to date. Um, wow. And by and large, most of those people Ron, are mass affluent or down. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's awesome to me because what we're doing is we're helping people either start or drive you know, their investing lives, right? Manage their money better. Um, and most of those people through our clients never had a chance to invest before because the barriers to entry were way too high, right? Mm -hmm. An account that has less, oh my goodness, what? No one wants my account. Half a million has, dollars, million dollars, right? yeah. 
Yeah. Right, exactly. And to the extent that you can use technology to drive down and be able to still service a client that has $100,000 in the account or $50,000, um, that's important, right? Because A, those same people, right, are going to be the half million, million, two million dollar accounts in 10 years. Um, and secondly, right, you should be able to scale up or scale down irrespective of how much money's in the account yeah. in terms of yeah. that experience for the end customer. Yeah, and I know as we were, you know, as we were building LifeWorks and, and when I first had the opportunity to meet you, you know, feels like 10 years ago, feels like yesterday. I think it was last year, but COVID's kind of put all of us in a, a weird spot, I think, where time seems to kind of move at different speeds. Um, you know, you and I spent some time talking about this, that, you know, the next-gen client, right, whether, you know, we say it's the millennial and even younger they know nothing but pushing a button on their smartphone and opening a bank account, buying something, um, and, and the immediacy effect of them being able to make decisions and the transparency that comes from it, right? It elevates their ability. Um, the word we've been using is kind of this democratization of finance, right? Where when you break down barriers, um, you know, you don't have to have a million dollars of investment assets to be able to have access to really good investment strategies. Uh, to me, when I look at stuff and I talk to advisors around the country and, and say, you know, do you have account minimums? Like, yeah, our minimums, you know, $250,000 or something like this. And I'll ask them why. And they're like, well, I, we just can't be profitable on a small account. And I think to myself, well, if, if Robin Hood and Wealthfront and Betterment and SoFi, and you mentioned some of these like leading robo advisors that are using technology to maybe bypass the advisor in some level have figured out how to do it, right? The wealth management community and us as advisors serving clients can certainly figure this one out. Yeah, I mean, look, take take a stash who I think is is doing some really incredible things. Um, their average account size is less than two thousand hmm. dollars, and we as partners have found a way to make that work, right? Um, yeah. to, to make that mm -hmm. profitable for both us and for them. And look, the only way you can make that profitable is is to cut out fat. And a lot of times the fat is just, just exceptions, right? Things that break and things that require somebody to interact to the extent that you can pull most of that out of the, the equation just creates efficiency where you can really scale mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. So we'll come, we'll come back to this technology piece, but I wanted to pick up on one more thing from your LinkedIn profile before we we maybe kind of jump into getting your thoughts on, on what's coming down the, uh, the pipe. You, you mentioned in your LinkedIn profile, um, you said, what book would I want with me if I was stranded on a desert island? Uh, one, that's a great question. I actually thought to myself, I, I have a small library in my house. I love to read. My team knows that. Tons of books all over my office. And I thought, pick one. Ooh. And then the book you picked was... It's, you said the same one that sits on my nightstand, Greg McEwen's Essentialism. Um, my, my take on that book, and I've read it a couple of times, um, and I'm actually rereading it now um, that, that I was prepping for this interview, is that it's this disciplined and focused pursuit of doing less, but also asking a better question, which is what is the most important problem to solve or, or what's really value? So taking a step back a little bit, Share with us how you think about this as the person setting the vision for Apex, where you have this massive technology apparatus. You could go direct to consumer. You guys know how to do it, right? Um, you guys could be using this central hub of technology and, and your brokerage platform and, and all this stuff. And you could be out there competing with Stash or, or doing other things. When you guys right now could go anywhere with your technology platform, how are you making these decisions? How are you filtering through the noise and getting down to what you believe is really the problems that Apex is best suited to solve and the things that you believe are the, the right place and the right intersection for you guys to be at? So, um, so yesterday I had a town hall meeting. So we, we're now at roughly 450 employees. And at the end, we get a you know sort of uh, un, you know, solicited questions that that I'll ask, ask or answer on on the fly. And, and one of the questions, which I thought was a really smart question, was what's what's my biggest challenge? And what is the thing that keeps me up at night? And it ties to essentialism. It's there's no shortage of opportunities. Like you said, okay, we could go direct to consumer. We could go after the institutional business. We could 
uh, continue to double down on fintech. We could push into advisory. I mean, there's no shortage of opportunities. And the biggest challenge, to your point, is is cutting through what. And by the way, they're all opportunities. Okay, hey, let's go international, right? Uh, the, no one's really made a dent into the China market. Let's let's drive into China. Um, and I'm sure we would have some success. The question is, where would you have the most success? What's what's my team here, hears me say it all the time? What's the greatest return on investment? And investment isn't necessarily just money. More importantly, frankly, for us is time, right? Because time is really precious, right? The opportunities are there, and the question is, how do you how do you stack those opportunities? Focus on the right things. And so that's, that's my struggle. The reason why this book stays with me and I read it over and over again is because um, I have wide eyes. I see all those opportunities and sometimes you just need good grounding around, okay, take a step back. Let's look at what's the greatest return on investment. Again, you know, not, that's not necessarily money, but just the investment that we need to put into this and make sure that we're not trying to do nine things just okay. All right, let's focus on two or three things and be great. Uh, and that's frankly, you know, through my career, that's worked really well. Um, and I think it's really worked well in my six-ish years at, at Apex, which is really kind of, okay, let's focus on one, two, three things, get them done, get them done. great, not good, not okay, but great. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get on to the next two or three things after that. Awesome. So jumping back to kind of the technology, I use the word and I think you used it uh, as well, kind of this democratization of finance, the digitization of it. I think it's maybe how you said it on your LinkedIn. Um, I think you guys have probably played maybe the biggest role in that being that central hub that pretty much every fintech and robo advisor has at one point in time probably touched. I'm sure there's some that you guys haven't, but it seems like all of the really disruptive ones and ones that are really pushing the edges of what's possible and how to engage run on you guys' platform or have at some point in time. As you've gotten to watch this and be involved in it, again, from a position where the retail consumer doesn't know Bill Capuzzi, doesn't know Apex, they know Altruist, they know Betterment, they know you know, Wealthfront, they know, you know something like this. Um, what are some of the, the, the most uh, exciting things that you see from this democratization of finance and what are some of the challenges that you've also seen maybe in our financial markets or operations just because of this new way of millions and millions of people being able to trade fractional shares or instantaneously you know move money 24 7 like share maybe just share some thoughts there about that well first thing i would say is and thank you for that that intro um yeah i'm proud of what we've done uh and i think we have uh, we were a pioneer in terms of, you know, if you go back to the Robinhood days, partnering with Robinhood to help drive uh, sort of frictionless account opening and uh, zero commission. And like you said, fractional shares, um, all the things that we've done over the past, you know, seven, eight years, I think is drove massive positive change in our industry. Mm -hmm. So, on the whole, I think, you know, boy, it's just a great time to be a retail investor um, because the, the solutions that are out there today are just so much greater and so much better than they were, you know, in, in, you know over the last 10 years. Um, you, you, you asked about um, where it's going. And I think, um, you know, we have a really, I have a really neat seat, right? So I get to meet people like you, Ron. Right. So we sat and had an awesome conversation and, and those, you know, I have those often with people and it's often people like you guys that are on the sort of bleeding edge of, of change and driving disruption. Uh, and I get to see it in many different sort of sides of our business. And the one thing I would tell you that um, for sure is coming is, you know, historically we've kind of worked in a stovepipe um, scenario. When you think about someone's financial life, think about your own life, you have your banking, you have your investing, you have your lending, right? You have your insurance. Let's just stop there on those four pillars. And except for the people that have lots and lots of money that have concierge service through their advisory, right? Most people, right? 
even people that are wealthy and then mass affluent down, they live in those four stovepipes. I have a Bank of America account. My check goes in. My you know my deposit from my employer goes into my Bank of America account. Then I have an investing life, and in my investing life, I have advisor who manages some money but he doesn't manage all my money. I have a 401k over here. And then I have some passions where I want to invest in individual stocks. So I have a third leg of my investing world. Then I have loans, car loans, home loans, student loans, uh, and then insurance, right? Life insurance, healthcare insurance. Mm -hmm. And what's happening, and we can see it happening, especially with the folks on the bleeding edge, those four are starting to come together. And I think that that is really cool. That's really powerful, right? And if you just took banking and investing, you put those two together and you said, okay, um, I can, I don't say control, that sounds terrible, but if I had your paycheck coming in and I could interrogate in a real-time way what money's coming in and out um, and then be able to see your investing life, right? Um, and then connect those dots, you can just create better yield for the end customer. Right? Yeah. And I think the best way that manifests itself is you know, quick, quick one here is uh, someone's why my dryer broke two weeks ago, right? Cause I got four <laughs> kids and there's lots of, lots of washing and drying in my house. Okay. Broke new washing machine or new dryer costs, whatever it was, 800 bucks. How do you raise $800? What's the best way for me to find that money? Okay, I have some money in the bank. I have investments. I could take out a loan. And to the extent that there was some way for you to press a button and say, with my life and what I have available to me, what's the best way for me to raise $800, right? Conversely, the other side of that, which is, hey, we're heading into year end, at least people in financial services, oftentimes you get a bonus check and you get an unexpected $1,200 into your bank. Mm. What should I do with the money? Right? And yeah, you could blow it and go party or go on vacation, fine. Um, but uh, let's put that part aside. How else should I invest it? Should I leave it in the bank? Should I pay down a loan? Um, I think what's neat and what we're seeing is that folks are trying to sort of connect those dots at, a, at the data level to be able to unlock better insight for the end customer. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the historical way, I think, you know, traditionally advisory just stuck to that one stovepipe. Um, what I'm seeing is that the fintechs are kind of cutting across um, and oftentimes the advisory world uh, sort of steals those ideas from the fintechs, right? And that's not a, that's not a bad thing. Um, I think in this case, a really good thing, which is we need to be more life coaches, help people manage their money, not their investments. Uh, and I think some advisors do that really well. The challenge is how do you do that in scale for people that, like we talked about before, that aren't the million dollar plus account um, and it takes technology, right? It takes efficiency in the way that you sort of connect those dots. Yeah, and, and you know, that's something that we've been, we've been working on and you know a little bit of our story, right? I mean, part of giving advice to clients is the more immediate and relevant and real time the information is, the more relevant and valuable our advice can be, right? It becomes less about should we buy this or buy that? And more about like, how do we make the best decision right now? Uh, because life never goes according to plan, right? Um, and, and one of the challenges that we see here is I feel like, you know, and I'll point the finger at those of us that are financial advisors, wealth management advisors, is that we're maybe still trying to shake off, or maybe some of us aren't, this idea that our only role is to help you invest your assets, right? When technology is making that maybe easier in some ways, more complex because there's more offerings in other ways. But most advisors, I think TD Ameritrade's study of their, you know, their RAAs uh, on their platform, they just released the, the 2021, something like 96 cents of every dollar of revenue came from charging a client an asset management fee, right? Which means four cents of every dollar 
was allocated to financial planning, guidance, tax returns, college planning, right? Like <laughs> one service accounted for 96% of, of our industry's revenue essentially, right? And at the same time, the you know, Ernst and Young's 2019 Global Wealth Management Report talked about how 50% of you know, wealth management clients across all segments, right? Uh, you know, baby boomers, millennials, uh, mass affluence, were dissatisfied with the fees they were paying, right? Um, and so I think that part of this, what you're talking about where, you know, these silos are coming together and, and FinTech is, is leading that, I actually believe it's gonna drive a change in how we have to price as advisors because it will be less about, hey, you need me to go buy that stock for you. And it will become more about, you want a coach to help you figure out how to navigate this at speed. Right, because the world also seems to be speeding up, even with COVID um, and being locked down in the state of Michigan, um, and, and New York and, and New Jersey, et cetera. Uh, like life's still moving fast, right? The world's still at warp speed. Um, so that's interesting that that um, you, you're seeing those things coming together on that side. Yeah, and, and, and to that point about you know, sort of people are not happy with what they're paying. You know, there's still there's still fat in in the commission rate, right? So on average, mm. I, I think the last I saw, the average rate is somewhere in the 80 basis point range, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, there's still there's still plenty of room there for people to be inefficient, right? To do things the traditional way. My biggest frustration mm. with the broader advisory world is just, there's just inertia, right? People mm. you know, sort of are set in their ways in the way that they do things and don't really want to change. Um, and I think to your, to your point about that is, you know, when you get into the 50 basis point range on average, you can't, you're out of fat, right? Now you're into the bone and the only way for you to sort of evolve, right? And, and frankly, then it's too late. If you get to that point and you haven't evolved your practice, it's really yeah, hard right. to turn on a dime. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I preach this to anyone who'll listen, it's now. The work to be done, you know, the work to, to evolve the practice to be more set up for 5, 10, 15 years is now. It's not to wait, right? Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll get to that two or three years from now. It's, it's now to make these types of changes because, you know, I think, to your point, I think that that, you know, it's a, the pin's going to get pulled at some point sooner than later. And I think you're going to start seeing a falling knife in terms of those explicit commissions. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I, I talked about this on a, um, an interview that's going to be released in a couple of weeks um, with another outsider to our industry, but he interacts a lot with advisors. And he made this interesting reflection that, you know, RIAs especially, right, registered investment advisors, will oftentimes kind of pound our chest and talk about, you know, our fiduciary duty and our independence. But at the same time, you know, having 96% of revenue tied to an asset management fee is not of itself maybe the greatest conflict of interest that exists out there right? Um, it's a little bit subtler because there's not a big commission that I'm making on it. But if that's the only way I get paid, then all the other stuff I'm doing is really a giveaway to, to that. And I mean, we've been passionately, you know, preaching with our clients and their advisors that, you know, we have to start thinking about shifting, right, to actually aligning value and charging for the things that clients want most, right? Financial planning, advice, guidance, life coaching, um, just even, hey, I've got you know, four kids, a job, my wife works, we've got all this busyness, like just can you help us navigate it, right? Things like that. And our industry still seems to be giving that away or advisors are relegating that to, well, maybe there's some, you know, FinTech that does dynamic budgeting or something and they're, I I agree with you. I I don't know whether it's a pin and then there'll be a knife there or whether advisors are gonna wake up one day and kind of look around and maybe feel like the taxi drivers in New York City that just watch the Ubers roll by them one after another and go, what happened, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So while we're talking about this, you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned, you know, five, 10, 15 years. Let's, um, a good segue here. Um, what are the top three to five challenges or, or maybe, you know, two or three challenges that you see advisors, both the individual financial advisor, maybe the firm, right, that you see advisors facing today? I mean, one, and I think this is a good problem to have, um, but can become overwhelming is the choice. I mean, mm. right, have you seen the, the, the Michael Kitsis placemat of different platforms and, and offerings out there? I mean, it's, it's staggering how many different alternatives and it's, 
it's sort of orthogonal in that, you know, it's not, it's not clear cut lines of demarcation, right? So mm -hmm. you have people that do risk, but the risk folks added on planning. You have people really good at planning that added on CRM capabilities for, for obvious reasons, really smart because they're like, hey, we have a niche here, but we have clients that want this, mm -hmm. this, and that. So one challenge I see if I sat in that seat is like, how do you cut through all of this, this sort of sea of opportunities and different you know, services and products and, and, um, and make sense of it? What's best for me, right? So it's easy where you and I are on this, people are listening or watching this and they hear me say, hey, you need to change now. It's like, well, where do I start? Um, yeah. And I think that that is a legitimate challenge um, around, hey, what's, how do I start this? Where, where should I go from here? Where do I get the best advice to, to sort of evolve my practice from where we are today to, to there? Um, second, I would say big challenge, I think it's tied to that is, is, um, is like I said before, inertia. And this is for, this is in, in my spot, right? So um, whether you, you know, sort of go back to that gasoline analogy, it's like, yeah, you know, Apex, you know, yeah, they're just like every, you know, the rest of the custodians. Um, and I think it's tied to, it's hard work to change custodians, right? To move oh, assets, sure. yes. <laughs> people find that yeah. to be really, um, you know, gut-wrenching. Um, and so, you know, I tie that to inertia. It's like, hey, we're stuck here because mm. to make this change is so difficult. Um, and God forbid we, we give our, our clients a chance to potentially look for somebody else to provide the services. So I think that, that you know, that, that second piece is just around, you know, sort of inertia to change. Um, and then the third, I think, um, which which is a good problem, I think, at least from my standpoint, is, hey, these these fintechs pay attention, right? So let's you know a, a, a SoFi, for example, right? They're not in this to just be, you know, to, to service the small account, right? And I think they're doing things that I think are really smart. And one of the things I find funny in our industry is that um, there's this perception and probably well-founded in, in the past is, you know, little accounts, they'll use those products, but when they actually grow up, we'll be there to catch they'll come them. back to us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that is a totally flawed strategy today. It may have been an appropriate strategy and mindset five, 10 years ago. Uh, but today, right. The, the, the seeds they're planting with those customers that are with them today and the loyalty that they're creating with those customers today and the products and services that they're extending beyond just an investment, like buy a stock um, today, um, it's going to be a lot harder to pull those clients out from underneath somebody that's really kind of creating that holistic kind of financial well-being solution set. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because two years ago when we were you know starting work on our software platform and, and kind of getting ready to build you know to where we're at today, one of the things that was written in our business plan was this idea that we were going to start seeing more of these rapid mergers and acquisitions and the established players, let's say in the industry, the the, the Merrill Lynch's, Morgan Stanley's, Goldman's, trying to buy technology to you know shortcut down into that um, um, business model. And we've seen that a lot, you know, in the last, you know, even this year, right, with Orion selling, you know, merging with Brinker and personal capital selling and United Capital going to Goldman. Um, and, and I wonder, though, knowing how long it takes to establish brand awareness and people building preferences, if just buying technology is going to is going to actually be the answer for, you know, those firms trying to drive change, change or if it, to your point, maybe it's too late, right? They've you know, there's already preferences established and people are already using something. Yeah, look, I, I think that there's, it's been fascinating this year, right? All the M&A activity, yeah. obviously yeah. all of the just, just broader activity in the, in the marketplace um, amidst all of this COVID, right? There's just more, yeah. there's more going on in our industry this year than there's been in years combined. Um, 
And I think some of it's actually really neat. And I think it, it actually could, uh, you know, I think it could work in terms of, you know, acquisition. So, you know, you mentioned uh, Joe Duran's business inside of Goldman. Um, part of the reason I think that that was smart is, okay, they, you know, okay, the, you know, the platform that came along with United, um, but Joe, Joe is somebody, you know, it was a bit of an aqua hire for Goldman to hire somebody inside of Goldman to help kind of stitch together. They have, you know, the um, ICO on one side, they have Marcus on the other, and somebody has to rationalize how these things should kind of connect. Um, I think Joe's helping there. By and large, uh, doing a sort of acquisition strategy to sort of solve your um, sort of broader vision challenges, really a bad play, right? Really a bad yeah, play. Yeah. And we see it, right? We see it time and time again where, hey, let's just go out and buy mm -hmm. a robo. Oftentimes, I mean, that was probably the one that, that was most prominent the last two years. In most cases, like with BlackRock, BlackRock's acquisition, they usually don't work doesn't work um, because just a bolt on technology without really a sort of firm strategy and vision, um, you know, is, is, uh, is a recipe for, for failure. Yeah. And, and the, I wonder if the buying the technology is even a little bit maybe post-mortem, so to speak, because the speed with which technology is moving, right? So one of the things I wanted to talk with you about was, you know, digital assets and decentralized finance, right? Maybe maybe the buzzword in some areas. I think for financial advisors in the wealth management space, there's still not a lot of adoption of, you know, digital assets or even maybe a, a broad awareness of what, you know, DeFi apps, decentralized finance, what this means to our business. Do you have some perspective on, you know, maybe the, you know, the beginning stages of this decentralized finance apps, smart smart contracts, digital assets. I know Apex has been in and, and custodying digital assets for a while. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that and how that might even relate to the technology today, one yesterday, but the technology that's being built, you know, that's coming is, and, and what the future is looks even radically different from the robo-advisor of today. Yeah, so... so I'm, I'm really interested in this space. I'm really curious to see how things are going to play out, right? The Fed has come out recently with some, some, you know, some talks around some rule changes to create sort of a, a digital currency. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned before being sort of mission driven. Um, and so we see most of these things, right? And, and like you said, we were one of the first to sort of support and partner with folks that want to create digital assets. I will tell you, it's it's had a very slow uptick, right? Obviously, you have cryptocurrencies. Most of the activity in cryptocurrencies is totally speculative trading. And people that just are buying and selling on, on movement in you know, Bitcoin or you know, Ethereum. Um, I do think uh, there are a number of companies uh, that are partnering with Apex um, that I think are doing some really smart things around, okay, let's digitize real estate, mm -hmm. right? So traditionally, and I'm, I'll use that one as a good example, digitize wine, right? So there's, there's massive storage facilities uh, in France that are holding people's wine. Um, can you digitize it and trade it? Sure. Okay, now it's tricky because you have to talk about the actual custody of the asset, right? Mm -hmm. There is no DTCC. There's no place for that, <laughs> that actual, that, that wine to be held. That's a good secure and control location. Um, uh, but I do think that concept of being able to digitize an asset to the extent that there's a good control location is interesting. Um, you know, and this is this is the world of alts, right? So think about you mm -hmm. know uh, liquid alts for, for wild, really wild high west. people. Yeah. The concept here is how do you democratize alternative investing? Mm. And the way to do that, the only way to do that, go back to a lot a lot of what you and I talked about, Ron, is is you got to somehow digitize it. Mm -hmm. You got to take those assets, put it in digital form and provide a chassis that allows for an investor that may not have a lot of money um, to have the opportunity to invest in 
you know, an apartment complex in, you know, in Miami um, by digitizing, um, you know, that, that asset. And those opportunities historically have always been really kind of held out for those that are wealthy, right? Those types of yep. investments. Um, so we'll see. I, you know, it's, it's early days. Um, I do think that there's going to be a bunch of momentum around this, especially around that alt space. Um, I am really curious and keen to keep an eye on what's going to happen with the Fed, um, because I think the digitizing of currency without the Fed's involvement and support really doesn't have, you know, doesn't, at least in the United States, probably won't have much, much, uh, much currency. Yeah. And, and, you know, as far as like, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, we, we get clients asking us about it all the time. And, and I said, I think there's a little bit of a danger in calling it currency because until we can pay our taxes with it, right? Uncle Sam, for those of us in, in the U.S., will always be able to force us to turn it into cash or dollars. Um, and so I, I do think the conversations at the central bank levels around creating digital assets, right, specifically, you know, some type of crypto-like dollar, right? That's that's controlled by the Fed. I want to ask this, though, as we as we maybe talk about digital assets and you know things like smart contracts and some of this technology that's out there. You mentioned this earlier, uh, you know, earlier about you know we still operate on T plus two, right? It's, you know, settlement date. How do you envision, or do you think there's going to be some impact from things like blockchain technology, smart contracts, as it relates to custodying of even something, you know, as benign as just a stock, right? Will it impact how we think about custodial records, books and records, and, and does that impact you guys? Yeah, for sure. Now the challenge there is. Um, you know, use a phrase I used before, which is you're only as good as your weakest link. The challenge with, with really going to a T0 real-time settlement is that all the participants, right, or the majority of participants really have to be in. <laughs> and uh, they all have know, to have a, they have to adopt a common framework. And, yeah, because otherwise, you know, you, you buy a, you know, a block of 100,000, well, 100,000 shares of Tesla um, the other side of that could be a thousand counterparties. And in order for this to work, every one of those thousand counterparties has to be digitized, right? It's not just DTCC has to be digitized. The counterparty, the actual person who's buying or selling on the other side of that transaction has to be able to sort of keep up. And I go back to that T2 example. You know, we're talking, this is 2018, right? 2018, the best, this is 2018, the best we could do is go from T3 to T2. Now, by the way, amazing. We took an entire yeah. day of risk a out of waste of off. Yeah. Risk. But then you take another step back and you say, really? 2018, the best we could do, the, you know, the, the most, you know, sort of, uh, you know, financially sound tech savvy country on the planet, the best we could do is go from T3 to T2. And the reason for it is that the infrastructures at the big banks are built on batch. Old COBOL code built in the 70s and 80s. And then what's happened is stuff has just gotten stacked on top of it. And so, you know, mm. can't fake real time at the core books and records of these firms. It's, it's an IBM mainframe running a batch environment. And until those things are, are sort of eliminated at the, you know, the state streets, the Bank of New York's, the ability for us to really lean in and get to a sort of a T0 digital mm. settlement for let's just, you know, sort of mainstream securities is really difficult. Um, but, you know, look, there's plenty of firms that are pushing on this, including Apex. We certainly have our, our hands in um you know, uh, just, you know, how we use blockchain within, you know, the organization, you know, the challenge is that you're, it's, it's, again, it's only as good as the guy or gal on the other side of that transaction in terms of the efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's an interesting point about the weak link, right? Because all of the parties to the transaction and even the custody of it along the way have to be on the same digital platform, right? Um, otherwise it stops and somebody has to take a paper record, <laughs> right, or an old record and turn it into um, that. Yeah, and we have the same problem in the wealth management space, right? There's still firms that are trying to figure out how to get rid of, you know, paper files and, and you know, uh, you know, run digital client files, right? 
Um, and, and that's a little bit of a scary thing and makes me chuckle a little bit because when we adopted a fully digital office, you know, we still have times where we have to print something, sign something, scan it, send it to a custodian because they require a scanned copy of somebody's wet signature. Right? Um, it, it always makes us chuckle. Yeah, for you, Ron, and for me, um, that, that creates opportunity. Right? So mm -hmm. thank God that those old banks still use COBOL code because it just presents yeah. um, opportunity uh, you know, for us to, to really continue to drive change in the industry. If, that was, if everything was modern, you know, there would be no Apex today. So maybe bringing the conversation a little bit to a close, and, and I'll actually toss it out there for you for final comments, but I got a couple of questions. One of them is, you know, maybe stealing from how Tim Ferriss ends his podcast a little bit, but if you could give, you know, one piece of advice or one message to the financial advisor that's watching this, the wealth management advisor, the owner of the firm, what's the one piece of advice that you would want to share the message that you would kind of want to put out there on the metaphorical billboard for everybody to see going by? Look, it, it's, it's be bold, right? I, I think it's, mm. it's not about today's making money today. It's thinking about, you know, the practice, uh, you know, five, 10 years from now. Um, you know, again, I mentioned the word inertia. It saddens me, you know, to talk to advisors who are, you know, aren't worried about that now. So be bold, right? You know, you know, if you really care about your clients and your practices, what, what are we gonna look like in 10 years? What is happening and how am I gonna evolve what we're doing today to that um, and get ahead of where things are. Um, and it takes, takes, you know, being, like I said, being bold, being courageous um, and taking some risk um, and I see, I don't see enough of that on the advisory side. And, and, you know, frankly, I think it's a really interesting time where people need to step up and be bold, especially the leadership. Yeah, that's awesome advice. Um, any, any closing thoughts, uh, maybe to tag onto that as we, as we wrap up here today or anything else you want to maybe share with the advisors and clients that are watching and listening? Yeah, look, I, I, I love this industry. Go back to me personally. Uh, I'm fortunate in the space that in the seat I'm in with the company I'm in uh, in, in this time. Um, and uh, you know, I think we all have a duty to take better care of our customers. And I think mm -hmm. there's tons of opportunity, great things that are happening in our industry, things that are happening with, with your company, Ron. Um, you know, again, and go back to that point before it's, it's open your eyes, right? The way you've done things historically should not necessarily be the way things um, go, you know, are going to be done on a go forward basis. Ask those questions, question things and why they're done in certain ways and look to, to take those bold steps forward. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Bill, I have, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. I wish I was sitting in your uh, swanky Manhattan office um, and, and, you know, gearing up for a workout in the gym there afterwards. Um, hope to see you in person again soon. Thank you for carving some time out of your very hectic schedule, I'm sure, um, to uh, have this conversation with us. And uh, all the best to you, Apex, and, and your family. So, Great to see you, Ron. Thanks for having me on.